So after 11 years of priesthood, I have finally figured out that there is a pattern to the gospel readings that we hear in the four Sundays of Advent. And because you few have come to church today, you will be privy to this secret knowledge too. <laughs> Aren't you glad you came? First of all, you should know that our Sunday church readings are on a three-year cycle, years A, B, and C, and we have just started year C two weeks ago on November 28th, Advent 1. And all three of those years, the gospel text for the first Sunday of Advent is about apocalypse, end times, disaster, and our need to keep awake so that we're not caught short when that day comes. The second Sunday of Advent, like last week, introduces John the Baptist in some way, a voice crying out in the wilderness, prepare the way of the Lord. The third Sunday of Advent, like today, John the Baptist gets center stage and speaks to the crowds or is the focus of the reading. The implicit theme today, or explicit in today's reading, is repentance. Finally, the fourth Sunday of Advent next week is about Mary. This year, she will visit her cousin Elizabeth and proclaim her Magnificat. Other years, the angel Gabriel announces that she will bear a child, or an angel appears to Joseph to let him know that it's cool that his virgin wife is pregnant. In every one of these fourth Sunday of Advent readings, someone is proclaiming that a great thing is about to occur. So, the pattern of these gospel readings in Advent always goes like this. Apocalypse, John. John, Mary. Or better put, keep awake, prepare, repent, proclaim. Now you too know the secret Advent pattern. But today, the third Sunday of Advent is also Rose Sunday. We have pink roses behind the altar. We have rose-colored vestments that Mother Nayan is modeling. And the word rejoice, because today is also known as Gaudete, or Rejoice Sunday. Gaudete is Latin. In the first reading from Zephaniah, we hear, Rejoice and exult with all your heart, O daughter Jerusalem. The canticle we read together from Isaiah insists, Therefore you shall draw water with rejoicing from the springs of salvation. And even Paul is in a good mood today. <laughs> in his letter to the Philippians, Rejoice in the Lord always. Again I will say, rejoice. But wait a minute. According to our pattern, this is supposed to be Repent Sunday, not Rejoice Sunday. So how does that work? Because remember, we also have that gospel reading from Luke, where the first words out of John's, <laughs> John the Baptist's mouth are, You brood of vipers, who warned you to flee from the wrath to come? Bear fruits worthy of repentance. So even as we're rejoicing in every other reading, John is dragging us back to the reality, saying, Not so fast. Well, again, it is a lucky thing you came to church today. Because I'm going to reveal an even deeper secret than that whole gospel pattern business. And that is this. Advent is about both repenting and rejoicing. In other words, Advent is about real life. You need both to be truly alive and aware. If your life were all rejoicing... You'd be a phony, selfish, and not in touch with the suffering of others. If life were all repentance, you would be rejecting the many gifts that God surrounds us with, like the beauty in nature and like love. Advent is a great season because it highlights the tension of those seemingly antithetical ways of being, repenting and rejoicing. Again, it's there in the readings the book of the prophet Zephaniah consists of nine oracles. Eight of them describe destruction and devastation being visited upon the people of Israel. Today, we hear from the ninth oracle, which returns their fortunes to rejoicing. 
So it's not a shallow celebrating which they are promised in today's first reading. It is one that follows suffering and loss. And then Isaiah's canticle that we read, it's proclaimed amid exile in Babylon. And Paul writes, rejoice. Again, I will say rejoice. But he's in a prison cell where he awaits trial and possible execution. These readings invite joy today, but they arise from pain and suffering. Just as this season of Advent invites us to a time of ambiguity. Now, I have clergy friends who over the years have said to me, Advent is my favorite season. And I don't think I'm imagining this. Some of them have said it with an almost self-satisfied tone, as if loving Advent was what the cool clergy did, while the rest of us were so obvious in our love for Christmas or Lent. It's like the tone someone takes when they tell you, I think the Stones are better than the Beatles. <laughs> when I ask these friends, well, why do you like Advent so much? They never have an answer. Oh, uh, well, the music is great, they insist. Anyway, this year I think I am ready to say, Advent is now one of my very favorite church seasons. But I can tell you why. It's because it can hold both repentance and rejoicing within its four weeks. The ambiguity, the ambivalence of Advent season feels deep and true to how we live our lives, especially as people of faith. We live these four weeks with one eye on the eternal and the other on the mundane. And you know, my friends are right. It's also in the music. We sing, lo, he comes with clouds descending, and our spirit soars to meet the theophany, the arriving of God, the appearing of God. While on the very same Sunday, we also sing, O come, O come, Emmanuel, longing for the arrival of the divine on earth as we mourn in lonely exile here. Each December we ponder the eternal, but also hear the words of this crazy man in the wilderness, clothed in coarse camel's hair and eating wild locusts, calling us vipers and comparing us to dead stones. Advent is both soaring and sorrowing, rejoicing and repenting, loving and losing. And how you choose to live within these four weeks might say something about your faith in general. So yeah, I love Advent. It's real. It doesn't pretend. It's all good. No worries. Yet it also holds out the hope that all will be good in the end and that worries will one day fall away. Stephen Charleston, a former suffragan bishop in the Diocese of California and a Native American elder, wrote this on his Facebook page last Sunday. Well, it's that time of year again, the season of our emotional ambiguity. Part of us wants to feel happy, and another part wants to hide. It is a season of cross currents, sad anniversaries mixed with wonderful memories, our genuine desire to celebrate a vision of peace with others, but also a need to withdraw and heal. Welcome to the tightrope of any festive holiday, the ancient bridge between light and dark. Let's cross it together. All of us who are sad and all of us who are happy and all of us somewhere in between. We can cross over this transition together with love our balancing bar holding sorrow and joy in harmony. Let us cross together. For isn't that at the heart of this, holiday, this holy season, finding hope in an ambiguous time? When John the Baptist scolds the crowds, they become afraid and ask, what then should we do? He answers them succinctly. Whoever has two coats must share with anyone who has none. And whoever has food must do likewise. This is how we bear good fruit. Sitting in my office yesterday afternoon, there was a knock on my door. 
I immediately got frustrated. I was trying to write a sermon. I was thinking, it's that damn Beverly again, wanting me to check if she has any mail because we let our homeless neighbors use the church address to get mail delivered. And she always comes when I'm in the middle of something like writing a sermon. But I opened the door, trying to smile. Well, it was a man I'd never seen before. His name was Ron. He's a member of the Los Gatos Rotary Club, and he had a ham to donate for our food pantry. Well, when I saw him, I relaxed, and I thanked him. He said, I try to give a ham or something to Joe Griner every year to help out with the homeless. You know, he said, I'm retired now, but I used to teach at Los Gatos High. I was the shop teacher. And some of these homeless people are my former students. Isn't that something? One of them, in fact, is buried in your garden. Joe showed me. So I try to help out because these were my kids. Repent and rejoice. Time and time again, I have to repent for my frustration at Beverly's knock on my door that keeps me from my work. When in fact, John the Baptist today suggests that my true work is answering that door, not getting sermons written. And time and time again, God sends people like Ron, who also knock on my door to remind me to rejoice that there are such kind and compassionate people in this world, heck, in this town, which is so easy to dismiss as boutique and bougie. My prayer for you in this and every Advent season is simply that you always answer the knock on your door that calls you to repentance and that you rejoice whenever what is on the other side of that door brings grace. Advent is both. And we are blessed that we get to cross that bridge of ambiguity together once more in this season. Amen.